Chapter 6 To Tell the Truth I remembered to pick up the Chinese food. It was a good thing I did, as I had just made it before closing time at the delightful dumpling. The food was still hot, but it would probably be a little soggy from the weight it endured while I talked to the police. The rain likely didn't help either as I pedaled home. Deciding to forgo putting the bicycle in the garage, I simply leaned it against a planter on the porch. Hopefully no one would be bothered to try to take it, since it was still pouring outside. I am so hungry, greeted Cat as she opened the door for me. You took forever. I already have all my homework done. Cat spoke in the exaggerated fashion teens always seem to employ. I wondered briefly if I had talked this way to my aunt while growing up in her house. I probably had, I decided. Setting the takeout on the counter, I debated telling Cat about what had happened tonight. I didn't want to upset her, but I also knew the town gossip would eventually reach her ears and she would learn all about it anyways. It was undoubtedly best to hear the news coming from me, yet I hesitated. Go get changed into something dry and I'll dish out the food, said Cat as she opened the bags. She had already set the table with my mismatch of various dishes found at garage sales over the years. The thing about Cat is, she is incredibly smart and mature for her years. Sometimes it's easy to forget she's only fourteen. While she held down a paper route, got top marks in almost all her classes, and did multiple extracurricular activities in an attempt to boost her eligibility for colleges, Cat also still slept with her favorite stuffed animal from childhood. My daughter was still at that sweet stage between childhood and adulthood, which made it difficult to determine just how much to say about quiet Carl. You're dripping on the floor, chastised Cat, tossing a towel onto the tired linoleum. She used her foot on top of the towel to mop up the moisture. Sighing, I went straight for the laundry room. Unbeknownst to Joan, I had inserted a hidden zipper into the dress years ago. I refused to have to do up and undo several dozen tiny pearl buttons just to don this dress. While Joan preferred authenticity, I preferred a bit of practicality. I tossed the dress into the washing machine and grabbed a large towel to wrap around myself before heading to my bedroom to get dressed. Cat and I had the first floor of the old Victorian house I had inherited from my aunt. The place had large windows with high ceilings, which made it a bit of a nightmare to heat in the winter months, and beautiful old moldings. Scarred hardwood floors and no longer usable fireplaces completed the beautiful home. At one time there was a servant's staircase in the back, but that had been taken out when the house had been converted into three apartments. There were two one-bedroom apartments upstairs. One was occupied by my long-term tenant, Greta, who was a retiree who still liked to work part-time and was a very active member of the community. The other apartment had belonged to quiet Carl. Grabbing a warm sweater on the way out of my room, I headed for the kitchen. I slipped the sweater on, trying to erase a chill that just wouldn't leave. Pulling out a chair, I sat down. Cat had already ladled out on our plates what we habitually ate. She expertly picked up a dumpling with her chopsticks. You might want to heat it up a little. Food was the last thing on my mind at the moment. I picked up my fork, more to have something to do with my hands, rather than that I planned on using it. Taking a deep breath, I decided to give the bare facts and answer any questions Cat might have. After the dress rehearsal, I stopped by the bridge. I was looking at the water and I happened to see something. This earned me Kat's full attention, as she was always curious. What did you see? I wasn't certain at first, so I went down beside the river to find out. I tried to explain, a shiver going through me. I found someone face down in the reeds. They weren't breathing and didn't have a pulse. I called 911. That's why I was late. I was talking to the police. For a moment, Kat didn't speak trying to absorb what I had just said. Wow. Yeah, I agreed. Who was it? Were you able to save him or her? You did CPR, right? How did they end up there? Rapid questions came from Cat. 
her food forgotten as she stared at me. I did CPR, but he didn't regain a pulse. The ambulance attendants didn't seem very hopeful. I tried my best to stay calm and collected as I told her the worst part. It was Carl. Kat scrunched up her face, trying to remember any Carls we might know. Quiet, Carl, I gently reminded her. Our tenant upstairs? Him? asked Kat in surprise. Yes, I sighed. I guess I'm going to be looking for another tenant. We both sat in silence for a moment, thinking over what had happened. You're okay, though, questioned Kat, concern in her eyes. I'm fine. I only lied a little. At least that was what I told myself. Besides, I'm the parent. I need to be strong, and sharing my concerns about Grimm's with my fourteen-year-old daughter was definitely not something I should do. I hadn't told her the worst part, nor did I intend to. While I had done CPR, there had really been no need to. Once the paramedics had shone their flashlights over Carl, it had been apparent he was never going to be revived. Carl had been bashed over the head with something which had connected with his temple. There had been a sharp cut in the skin and broken bone beneath. Hi, it's Josephine again. I know these chapters are pretty short, and I am releasing three of them a week rather than my usual two a week for audiobooks. But if you're impatient and you can't wait for me to release the entire audiobook here on YouTube, I have a solution. You can go over to Audible and purchase the audiobook there. Or if you have an Audible membership, you can use a credit. Thank you for listening. Take care.